Hello, my name is Bruce Webb. I'm a pilot with Airbus Helicopters. This video is intended as support to H-125 operators. It includes some basic principles associated with the pilot pre-flight check. This video is not a substitute for training, nor is it a substitute for following the flight manual, the pre-flight checks in the flight manual. The degradations shown as examples within this video are there to raise awareness. It gives examples of where beyond limits, and that's what we're here to detect. We're here to detect anywhere beyond limits. During the video, we will discuss the flight manual itself to include the pre-flight checks, supplements, etc. We will examine some visual inspection techniques that we believe are valuable and helpful for conducting a proper pre-flight check. So we will conduct an exterior check, then the interior check. We'll discuss some optional equipment which is commonly installed on the aircraft and the STCs which go with those, that equipment. We will also look at the individual aircraft protections and external publications. And finally, we will have an addendum with additional information for your use. We will now see together the proper way to conduct a pilot pre-flight check. We will refer to the appropriate parts of the rotorcraft flight manual, in this case, the pre-flight check portion. But before we start, it's important to avoid distractions. So what we advise is ensure that persons around you are well aware that you're conducting a pre-flight check and during your examination of the helicopter they shouldn't disturb you. Shut off your cell phones. Do anything that you can to ensure that you are not distracted because distractions during a pre-flight can be very dangerous. Also, we want to ensure we don't introduce FOD, foreign object debris, to the aircraft. So many of us wear IDs, badges, remove those before the check and set those aside. We would also encourage you to have a flashlight during the pre-flight check. One good rag, so if you find any debris, dust, oil, contaminants, you can remove them. And finally, I like to use a pair of gloves. Now, it should not be the same gloves you use to fly because if you contaminate them with petroleum products, it defeats the purpose for uh, a personal protective device in the cockpit. So, a good set of clean gloves, a rag, a flashlight, and no foreign objects which may be introduced to the aircraft. We also need to make sure to ensure that the flight manual is up to date so that we're following the pre-flight check, the most current version. Additionally, ensure that the corrective, any maintenance action, any write-ups in the tech log are addressed and that the aircraft is indeed airworthy from a, a record standpoint. If it's not, please don't fly the aircraft. Also, if you're using an MEL, ensure that your MEL items are properly logged and cleared as required. The pre-flight check that we'll be following today is found in section four, the normal procedures of the flight manual. The check takes place in five steps. The external check takes place in five steps. We'll, we'll go through each one of those individually. So we'll do section zone one, two, three, four, and five, and then we'll do the interior check at the end. In this video, we're conducting a pre-flight on a standard H-125, a, a fairly basically equipped H-125. Don't forget, however, that you need to incorporate the pre-flight checks for any supplements or optional equipment that you have installed on your helicopter. So you can go to the supplement section of the flight manual, and there's a list of the supplements which apply to your aircraft. So ensure that that's up to date as well so that you're using the most current information. One of the most frequently used supplements is the cold weather supplement. It's actually supplement four in this section, instructions for operation in cold weather. So if you're going to operate your helicopter in conditions at zero degrees Celsius, 32 Fahrenheit, or in uh, icy conditions, uh, snow, things of that nature, you want to apply the cold weather supplement. 
We will do this at each station during our standard pre-flight. We'll discuss and denote the individual items at each station which would be applicable to a cold weather operation. There are a couple of techniques which we believe are effective in conducting a proper pre-flight check. The first is a Japanese technique called shisha kanko, uh, point and touch. So when you're looking at something, it's very effective to uh, actually identify the item and follow it with your eyes. So for example, if I'm looking at the windscreen for proper installation of the hardware, uh, I can point and follow with my eyes each individual screw or hardware to ensure that it's properly installed. Additionally, in conjunction with that, a flashlight is effective. We've discussed that uh, at the beginning that a flashlight is useful and you'll notice even in a well-lit hangar, a flashlight illuminates a point. So we can look at the structure of the aircraft globally and, and, but if we want to look more closely at any item, a flashlight is an effective tool in combination with Shisha Kanko to uh, focus our attention. It works well. Try it. So as an example, if we're pre-flighting the windscreen, the transparent panel, the windscreen, and we're looking at the hardware which attaches it, as I touch each hardware, I can say flush, 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 flush. Flush. Now, of course, I can't get to the top of the windscreen without a ladder, but I can still point, point, I don't have to touch, I can still point and say flush, flush, flush. And in doing so, it, it greatly reduces the opportunity to miss something. In fact, perhaps as, as high as 85% we increase our ability to detect an error, to detect something that's incorrect by 85%, so it's very effective. As well, we, we've talked about uh, a flashlight. Of course, we should perform a, a pre-flight in the most uh, well-lit environment possible. So certainly, we'd all like to pre-flight in a well-lit hangar. Sometimes that's not available. We understand this. So you should always have a flashlight with you, again, in a hangar or not in a hangar. If you're not in a hangar, the flashlight is very effective just to sweep across and get a general view of the aircraft, of the component that you're inspecting. But as importantly, again, whether you're in a hangar or not, you can see that if I shine the light on the, the nose of the aircraft, it makes that portion very visible. So again, it's a way to focus our attention to reduce the propensity to overlook something. A good tool. Please, use a flashlight. Of course, we all know that degradation in a component or any part of this helicopter, uh, they may be quite visible, they may be difficult to find. So, you know, a another good use of the flashlight is to, you know, make broad, sweeping, very deliberate motion across the surface to see if there's cracking or, you know, deformations, uh, blistering. This is a good technique to detect that. Uh, should you find something like this, should you find perhaps a crack on the windscreen or on the transparent panel, in the pedo head, any, anywhere, bring it to the attention of the technician. Don't assume that it's okay. It, it may be, it may not be. And while I've demonstrated or we've discussed a few of the possible degradations here, it's not an exhaustive list. And we still must always be vigilant throughout the entire pre-flight check for other areas that may be damaged. We'll begin the pre-flight check at Station 1, it's located just here to the pilot door. The transparent panel, so the windscreen, the chin bubble, the overhead panel, must be clean without impact damage, no crazing, no cracking, and certainly no degradations which would hinder the vision of the pilot. If you have windshield wipers installed on the aircraft, check the condition of the wiper blades for demanding. Windshield wipers must never be operated with a dry windscreen because that in itself can cause damage, uh, scratches. Don't forget to look at the cleanliness of the engine oil cooler inlet and that the cover is removed. 
in case of cold weather, remove the snow and ice accumulations around the oil cooler area and on either side of the windscreen and canopy. The air must not be obstructed. Ensure that the rod which holds the wool string for the side slip indicator is removed from the stowed position and the, the wool string is in good condition. Also ensure the pitot tube is, the cover is removed and the pitot tube itself is firm and stable with no cracks and it's not obstructed, the, 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 the hole itself is not obstructed with snow, ice, or other debris. Now let's check some items on the belly of the aircraft. We want to ensure that the landing light is secure, the lens is clean and undamaged, the same for the taxi light, that the lens is clean, undamaged, and it's secure. While we're in this area, we can check the two static ports to make sure they are unobstructed and secure. And finally, the temperature sensors to ensure that they are both uh, secure. And now we arrive at station two, the doors. We first want to ensure that the attachment hardware for the hinges, for the lower and upper hinges, which are also the door jettison pins, are all secure. So the, the attachment points are secure. We will ensure that the door opens and closes smoothly, latches smoothly. And lastly, to ensure that the door jettison handle cover is installed. Be careful not to jettison the door. As we continue with station two, we arrive at the aft sliding door. We want to ensure that it operates smoothly, latches in the open position, we can release the latch, so the door functions correctly, latches. Again, the transparency is clean, clear, no crazing, no cracking. We'll move further aft to the baggage compartment. We'll open the baggage compartment. This is obviously an area where you can store equipment or baggage. Uh, we want to make sure that it is clean, dry, and obstructed. Within the baggage compartment, we will find the oleo dampener for the front cross tube, the left side front cross tube. And we wish to ensure that it is secure and that there is no oil or debris along uh, the top of the uh, dampener itself. Let's continue our check with the aft baggage compartment. We want to ensure again that the hinges, the rivets, the door pins are all secure. We will then open the compartment, make sure the door seal is functional, the compartment should be clean and dry. Be aware that moisture can come from above, so check the top of the compartment to make sure there's no liquids dripping down. If installed, some aircraft will have an emergency locator transmitter installed. If yours is installed, if you do have an ELT, ensure that the switch is in the armed position so that it will operate uh, as required. In each baggage compartment, in this baggage compartment, the previous one and the one on the other side, we put a placard in which will describe the maximum amount of load you may place in the baggage compartment. Please abide by that value and do a proper weight balance calculation. So not only put the weight in, put, put your baggage in, but then go to the flight manual, pull out the most current weight balance data, and do a proper weight balance calculation so that you remain within the CG envelope and the maximum gross mass of the aircraft. If, if you'd like not to do it in, in a longhand version, Airbus has an app. The app is called Flight Planner. It's an excellent app which will allow you to do this calculation quickly and seamlessly. Once we're finished with the rear cargo area, we can shut the door, place a little pressure, and close both latches. Once we're finished with the baggage compartment, we can close it up. So we'll release the load on the rod, secure the rod, and before we close it, we want to make sure you know, nothing is hanging out. Uh, so we'll Put a little pressure here, latch, latch, and latch. And the baggage compartment is closed. Let's continue in the transmission compartment. We will open the latches. 
gain access. Raise it up, we can remove the bar which will support it. And at first, let's just take a look at the general condition and security. So again, rag in hand, should there be any dust, debris, uh, fluids, wipe them up. If there are fluids and you're concerned you have a leak, again, find a qualified technician to, uh, to examine that further. Open the compartment. Just take a moment to examine the general condition and cleanliness. So again, with a sweeping motion of the light, just take a few moments to look at uh, the entirety of the area. If you have a rag with you, it's a good opportunity to uh, clean off any debris, dust, things that might be on the, on the deck. If you find fluid, again, you may wipe it up with the rag. But if it's, if it's excessive or if you're concerned that there may be a leak, again, please find a qualified technician to examine further. We do want to pay special attention to the hydraulic block. Uh, to ensure that the hydraulic uh, filter pin has not deployed, has not activated. There's a red, a little red button here which will extend should the filter clog. We want to ensure that that is not activated. In this case it's perfect, it's fine. We want to ensure that the uh, filler cap is securely down on the main rotor gearbox. Here we can see the main rotor gearbox oil level, we want to ensure that it is correct, and in this case it is. And finally, this is a dual hydraulic system helicopter, so it's not standard, it's, it's, it's a, a dual system. So we have a reservoir, a dual bodied reservoir, and we can see just here that this is correctly serviced. So let's go ahead and close the compartment now, so we need to ensure uh, I've set my flashlight down off to the side of the aircraft, my rag as well. Uh, please don't close the cowling with any, don't introduce FOD yourself. So the area is clean. I will raise the uh, cowling slightly to relieve the pressure on the handle. I'll allow it to shut. Once it's shut, take each individual toggle latch, place it under the lip, push it down, it locks, and the cover, install the cover. The same for the front latch. So again, ensure that it's correctly installed. And then the two snap latches. So again, ensure the area, there's no deformation, no damage. It's correctly secured. Let's ensure that the fuel cap is installed, correctly installed and secure. So I'm gonna put the fuel cap on the filler neck. Rotate the cap until it's on the aircraft itself. Then press down on the locking mechanism and ensure the cap is secure. Additionally, we'll make sure that the deck drain is uh, unobstructed here so that any fluids which might reside on the deck are able to drain overboard properly. The aircraft is designed to allow the pilot to access the main rotor system without need of an extra ladder. So let's climb up on top. So step, cross tube, handle, and we're on top prepared to inspect the main rotor. In case of cold weather, ensure there's no ice adhering to the pitch change links, the swash plate, the scissors link, the drive link, the servos themselves, the main rotor blades, the rotor, the star arms, the star, the uh, rotor head fairing, just in general make sure there's no ice adhering to anything on the aircraft, especially in the main rotor head area. Let's take a few minutes to check the main rotor head and its components for condition and security. Of course we want to check the general overview of the area to make sure there are no uh, bird nests or any kind of an obstruction within the cowling. We want to ensure that the swash plate, the stationary portion, the rotating portion, the pitch change links, the drive link, the bonding braid, the actual blade pins, the lower sleeve, the star arm, the upper sleeve, the frequency adapter, 
the spherical thrust bearing here at the, the base of the star arm, that they're all in good condition and safe for flight. We will want to check the top of the system as well. So we'll come up here, we can look down the blade, we can look at the top of the system itself, the anti-vibrator, the anti-vibrator springs. Again, we just want to ensure that the ship is safe for flight. So I suggest that you check one station, then you come down, you can rotate the blades until the other one is here, check that blade, and then the subsequent blade for completion. To do a good visual examination of the main rotor blades, it's best to have a ladder. Uh, clearly then you can inspect more closely down the, the, the top, bottom, leading and trailing edge of the blade. Oftentimes, however, we don't have a ladder. So if that's the case, just take a moment, again, look closely, as close as you can down the top, bottom, leading, trailing edge of the blade. Pay specific attention to the trim tabs. And then what you can do is, after you've Examine one blade, rotate the rotor system, you can rotate the rotor system, be sure there's nothing that would impact, and then check the next blade. Be careful climbing back down, make sure you place your hands and feet in the correct holes. Now it's time to obtain a fuel sample. I wear gloves. It's important to remember not to use your flight gloves because if you contaminate them with fuel, it obviously defeats the purpose. So again, I will wear gloves, not flight gloves. We also need a pair of safety glasses because you don't want fuel splashing in your eyes. So we'll put the safety glasses on. We will use the proper sump tool. So I have the tool here. I will Place it inside the reservoir, draw a sample, and see I have a, a good quantity of fuel. Um, you want to ensure that the fuel in your sample is not contaminated, no water, no debris, that it is clear and bright, and of course properly dispose of the sample, or if you don't dispose of it, uh, uh, some of you may keep the sample for uh, safety during the day. And now we're at the end of station two. The intermediate structure is the end of station two. The last item we will check here is the ELT antenna, the emergency locator transmitter antenna, if installed. So again, condition and security, make sure it's undamaged. We'll begin station three. So the tail boom on this side begins station three. We'll start with the VOR antenna. Again, condition and security, make sure it's undamaged, properly secured to the tail boom. This is also an excellent time to look at the junction between the intermediate structure and the tail boom itself. So we'll carefully examine this structure, the rivets, uh, for any damage or deformation. It's a perfect opportunity to use the light and scan across looking for any buckling, again, deformation, damage. Should the aircraft have experienced a hard landing, this is an area where buckling may be observed, so pay close attention here. As we move further aft, we have the terror drive shaft cover, and each of the, uh, the, the fastening uh, screws, they're quarter-term Zeus fasteners, we want to check the alignment and make sure that the head is all in alignment with the airflow, so they're all level. So we'll check each one of those. We'll also check the drive shaft heat shield cover for condition and security to make sure it is secure. And finally, just as a general overview, should you be operating in an area where it is cold, where there may be snow, frost, ice, ensure that the entirety of the tail boom is free of those items. And finally, don't forget the VHF antenna. It's located at the bottom of the tail boom. So again, condition and security of the antenna. As we continue through station three, we find ourselves at the horizontal stabilizer. We want to check the trailing edge of the stabilizer, of course, the leading edge, uh, the bottom, the top, make sure it's free. Uh, we also want to check the attachment of the stabilizer. So we have a 
through bowl at the top and at the bottom, we want to make sure absence of cracking. Uh, the rivets, as the through the plate, which the deviler plate here on the tail loop, check to make sure there's no working rivets. You can grasp the stabilizer, kind of shake it up and down, forward and aft, and make sure that there's no play in the stabilizer. And finally, with respect to this, check the position light, make sure that it's secure, the lens is clean, and uh, it, it's not going to go anywhere during flight. As we move aft, we can continue to check the carrier drive shaft cover. Uh, it segues into the carrier gearbox cover. The same things apply with respect to the fasteners. Make sure they're horizontal. We'll check the oil level here. It should be between the red line and the white line. If you're unsure, you can gently shake the aircraft and clearly see the oil level. At this point as well, we can check the terror guard uh, for security. So security at the back, security at the front. It's okay to grasp it, gently shake it, make sure it doesn't, it's not loose. We'll check the fitting for the lower stabilizer. Again, we're checking for absence of cracking, any deformation, degradation of any sort. Looks good. The tail skid, we want to make sure the tail skid is not deformed. Uh, again, not too thin at the back. If it struck the surface, uh, it could be worn, which could be dangerous, so we want to make sure that that is secure. We'll come up to the attachment points for the vertical fin. We'll check the vertical fin briefly with our flashlight. And then lastly, we'll speak about the security of the aft position light. As we come around the back of the helicopter, we now find ourselves at the beginning of Station 4, the tail rotor. We want to check carefully the tail rotor blades, the paddles, each blade for condition and security, no damage, no impact damage, especially on the leading edge. A good way to do that is with your hand to tactfully feel it. So run your hand across the blade, the inboard portion, the outboard portion. Um, check for any uh, signs of damage to the spar, cracking, crinkling sounds by a flying load inboard, pulling outboard. There should be no sounds, no crackling sounds. And finally, check the tracking fingers more commonly called an impact tab, but they should be undamaged. They should be sticking straight out. Now we find ourselves at station four. Let's have a look at the tear rotor head. So we want to check for, again, condition and security. The laminated bearings, we have four of them, two on each blade at the root of the blade to make sure there's no evulsions, that they're not cracked or in good condition. We'll check the pitch control links, the PC links, again, for condition security and that there are no evulsions, that the rubber is in good condition, the laminate. Let's examine the pitch change spider a little more closely. There's a greasert here, so this is a greased item. We want to make sure that it's not over-serviced or we have grease runs or oil dripping from here from the grease separation. So pay close attention here. We also want to ensure that it's not discolored, which would be an indication that perhaps there was insufficient grease or the incorrect grease, and this assembly may have gotten too hot. So again, discoloration, any, any, any deformation and paint chips, etc. Take a close look. Ensure that this is uh, in good condition for flight. As we continue down the starboard side of the aircraft, we'll check the horizontal stabilizer just as we did on the port side. So again, Condition security, make sure it's uh, uh, fixed to the aircraft securely. The position light, the rivets, the attach bolt, the through bolt. Again, just as we did on the port side. That's the same as we as we look at the uh, tear rotor drive shaft cover. Ensure the quarter turn Zeus fasteners all are in alignment. The heat shield is secure. The general condition of the tail boom as well. Won't be uncommon to have a little bit of uh, residue on the tail room. We have a, another VOR antenna, confirm its condition and security. And then finally, the attachment point between the tail boom 
and the intermediate structure on the starboard side of the aircraft. So again, condition and security. We're now going to begin station five. So the exhaust nozzle. We want to make sure there's no foreign objects in the exhaust nozzle. If there are snow and ice present, we want to ensure that it is clear. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's proper if you do have snow or ice on the aircraft to remove all the snow or ice before removing the exhaust nozzle cover. That way, objects that you're cleaning off don't end up in the exhaust nozzle. So I have a ladder here, so I can step on the ladder, and with a flashlight, I can look clearly into the exhaust nozzle and ensure it's unobstructed. I realize some people don't always have access to a, a ladder, so if that's the case, you'll just need to stand back as far as necessary to shine a light in and, and confirm that it is clear of obstructions. As we continue through station five, we want to ensure that the engine cowling latches are all properly latched. The environmental shields cover closed, so it's latched. So to ensure that the cowling is, the engine cowling is properly installed. We'll move forward. We have the external power unit door, the EPU door. This is where the EPU plugs. The door should be closed, the button depressed, and the door is secure. Just below the door is the engine deck uh, hose, uh, similar to the one on the port side. So this drains this side of the transmission and engine compartment. Moving further forward, the baggage compartment. We we'll open the baggage compartment. Just as we discussed on the port side, we have storage here. This particular aircraft has an air conditioning unit installed in this compartment, so it does reduce the space available for our baggage. However, you may still store baggage here. Again, as discussed before, ensure that you do proper weight and balance. Because there's an air conditioner here, not only because there's an air conditioner here, be sure you don't have any uh, fluids, leakage, water damage uh, dripping down from the air conditioning unit or from the deck above. The front shock absorber for the uh, front cross tube is located here, just as on the other side. So we want to ensure that it is free of damage and there's no fluid visible on top of the shock absorber. When that's finished, we can shut the door and latch the baggage compartment. Now let's look inside the main rotor gearbox on the starboard side of the aircraft. First, we'll need a flashlight. We can shine the light through this hole, this compartment uh, opening, and see the engine oil level. In this case, it is between the min and the max line, which is appropriate. We can also step just here, look through this window, and see the hydraulic fluid level. So to see a little more closely, let's open the cowling so we can see more closely what we're looking at. So here is the engine oil reservoir. You can see the sight glass. There's a min line here, a max line, and you want the fluid to be between the two lines. The engine oil filler cap is secure. The hydraulic reservoir level is just here, and again we can see it's appropriately serviced. We have another hydraulic block on this side, and the clog pin is not uh, sticking out. The little red button is not sticking out, indicating the hydraulic system is free of contaminants. And again, our rag to ensure that the, the transmission deck itself is clean, if there's any drips, dirt, debris, you can wipe them off uh, with your rag. Should you find yourself in a situation where you're not certain if the oil level is appropriate, perhaps it is right on the min line or just slightly below the min line, we would recommend before adding fluid, adding oil to the engine oil reservoir, at the completion of the pre-flight, uh, with everything cowled back up, start the aircraft up, 
don't fly, just start the aircraft up, let it run on the surface for 5, 10, perhaps 15 minutes, depending upon the outside ambient temperature. Then shut the ship down, allow it to rest for 5, 10, 15 minutes. Then recheck the fluid level, the oil level. Oftentimes you will see that it is now appropriately serviced. The level will be between the min and the max line. Additionally, when you look in the sight gauge here, the sight glass for the oil level, you will see three small balls usually sitting on the bottom. Those are actually agitators. They are there to clean the, the sight glass windows so that uh, you can see it clearly. So they're not intended to float, they're agitators. Let's check the engine inlet. We'll climb up on the aircraft. We have the cover installed. We'll remove the cover by pulling on these pads. It releases the cover from the four attachment points. Make sure there's nothing on the cover that could drop down into plenum and remove the cover. As we spoke before when we were speaking about the exhaust nozzle cover, make sure if there's snow or ice or debris, make sure that you don't remove the exhaust nozzle cover until you've removed this so you don't contaminate the exhaust nozzle. Once we have the cover removed, we want to check the screen, that there's no damage, the screen is intact, and look down in the engine inlet plenum itself. Look into the plenum and make sure there's no debris in that area as well. While we're in this position, let's take a moment to ensure that the belly panels are securely in place. The aft belly panel has a total of 10 toggle latches, five on each side of the aircraft. We have a forward belly panel with three toggle latches on each side of the aircraft. Ensure that they are all secure. Additionally, let's look at the landing gear while we're in this position. We can look at the aft cross tube to, for condition and security. The step. The aft cross tube saddle. So we want to look at the attachment bolts to make sure there's no cracking uh, at the bolt head or at the nut side of the bolt, the inside portion. The, the aft portion of the cross tube for the steel spring extension to make sure it is uh, not worn and is holding the heel of the skid slightly off the surface. The step, of course, the skid tube itself, the forward cross tube, and the forward cross tube saddle. Again, uh, pay special attention for potential cracking in this area. And finally, take a moment to examine the wear plates on the bottom of the skid tube for proper security and potential damage. We're going to finish station five near where we began at the front of the helicopter. So just as we did on the port side, we want to ensure that the pilot door opens and closes smoothly. We want to ensure that the hinges and the jettison pins are all secure, there's no damage, and that the actual jettison cover is installed and secure. In addition, the transparent panels, the transparent panels, no damage, no crazing. The seals are all installed correctly. We'll come back to the back sliding door and open it, ensure it locks into position. Secure, we'll release it, shut it. Transparent panel is clean, seals installed. This side looks good. The interior check consists of inspecting the general condition and cleanliness of the cabin, seats, and windows. Actively look for small unsecured items lying about the cabin. They may cause damage or become an impediment to the flight controls. Check for signs of water infiltration from the overhead, uh, the security of the controls, and if you carry loads or objects in the cabin, ensure that they are properly stowed and secured. We must make sure the flight manuals on board the aircraft, as well as the fire extinguisher. This is the typical location for the fire extinguisher. Um, however, it could be relocated based upon uh, other STCs that may be installed in the aircraft. But this is a typical location. You want to make sure that it's properly charged, that it's displayed in the green. As well, 
We want to make sure that the fuses and circuit breakers are all correctly installed, nothing is tripped or popped. And finally, we, you can see perhaps more clearly the door jettison handle to make sure that it is um, installed. And even though it's not mentioned in the pilot pre-flight, the aircraft is equipped with an Apario system. So ensure that it is secure, pointed downward at the instrument panel, and there's a door here, you can open this and ensure that there is a small SD card installed, which is necessary for the operation of the system. You may have installed options on your helicopter. Verification of their condition must be included in the pre-flight check. Please find the short videos of several popular options at the end of this video. Here, an example of an option concerning the cargo swing. This option is often installed on the H-125. In section 4.1, you could find the inspections to be added to the pre-flight check. Check the correct opening of the hook in electrical and mechanical control modes. Check that the retaining latch is free to rotate and check the operation of the retaining latch return spring. To check the barrier filter, you must open the engine cowling and inspect the cleanliness of the engine air intake. The sand filter itself must be free of foreign objects, ice or snow. This is the case in and around the engine air intake as well. There must be no stagnant water at the drain hole and be sure to close and latch the engine cowling. Additionally, you can be equipped with a locator searchlight. As with other lights, check the cleanliness and condition, that is to say, no cracks in the lens or the unit itself. You may have installed a cable cutter, a wire strike protection system. Verify the integrity of the components and mounting hardware by applying hand pressure and checking for looseness and the general condition of the installation. Inspect the general condition of the hoist and cable. Check the hoist arm and arm locking finger. The cable protectors on landing gear must be secured. The flotation gear must be locked in the lowered position. Inspect the condition of protective covers and the pressure in one or both of the inflation cylinders. Should you have settling protectors installed on the skids of your helicopter, commonly called bear paws, you should inspect the general condition of these and ensure there is no cracking. Now let's take a few moments to learn to install the main rotor blade tie-down sock. First we'll take the tool. It's, it's in two separate pieces. We have to assemble it. So we will assemble one component into the other. Then take the pin, which is a small pin, install it into the hole, which makes this now one piece. We'll now take the tie-down sock. It has a steel pin as well, which fits into the tool. It rotates and locks into position. Once it's locked into position, take the tie-down to the blade. Carefully raise the sock to the main rotor blade. Slowly pull the sock under the blade its full length. Pull a bit of tension with the rope while pushing up gently with the tool. Rotate the tool to disengage and remove the tool from the blade sock. To remove the blade sock from the main rotor blade, take the tool, slowly raise the tool to the blade sock, push up on the tool while pulling a little tension on the blade sock rope to engage the blade tool. Once it's engaged, slowly push the blade sock off the blade and you can rotate it and remove it. Suppose you find yourself in a situation where you do not have the tool to install the main rotor blade sock. An acceptable alternative is to set the sock on the surface, take the rope, maybe a fair length of rope, what I'm going to do is cast it over the top of the main rotor blade, being very careful not to touch the trim tabs on the trailing edge of the blade. So, we'll gently throw the rope over the main rotor blade. Once the rope is over the blade, and again, confirm it's outboard, it's not near the trim tabs. Pull the sock up, 
So the main rotor blade socket's in your hand. Now gently pull down the blade, reaching up the top, slide over the tip. Now you can pull the blade sock rope to the surface and gently pull the sock onto the blade. If you find yourself needing to remove the blade sock and you don't have the proper tool, it is acceptable to gently take the rope, pull the socks gently off of the blade. Now let's install the tail rotor immobilizer block. So we will place it between the two tail rotor paddles. So we'll slide it in like this, put the pin in from the top, gently push the pin through so that it's through the top, the bottom, and the middle. And we'll push the cutter pin in here, and the block is correctly installed. Installation of the pitot tube cover is quite simple. Prior to installation, it's important to ensure that the pitot tube is cool to the touch. If that is the case, take the pitot tube cover, gently support the back of the pitot head, just gently, and apply a small amount of pressure and slide the tube cover over the pitot. Installation of the static port protections are quite easy and quick. We'll simply slide the pins into each static port, ensure they're secure, and the job is complete. To complete the installation, we'll climb on the side of the aircraft to here. We'll carefully pull the cover taut over the handhold. While holding the cover in position, we'll take the front strap, insert it. We'll take the back strap and insert it. Continue all the way up just to double check that it's all correctly laid flat. So again, we've installed the other side of the engine inlet cover. We have the two straps attached. Now we're going to climb up on this side of the helicopter. We're going to carefully pull the cover so it's over the handhold here. We'll check to make sure that it is straight across the top. Once it is, we'll gently pull down on this strap, affixing it to the cowl. Then we'll gently pull down on this strap, affixing it to the airframe. And the engine inlet cover is properly installed. And finally, we'll install the exhaust nozzle cover. This is typically the last thing that we do because we want to allow the exhaust nozzle itself to become cool to the touch. So, in this case, I will need a ladder, a step ladder. So, we'll carefully climb the ladder, place the bottom of the cover on the far side, pulling the cover towards you. Getting it in position. It may take a moment or two to get it tight and secure. And of course, we have the tail for visibility, so we don't forget to take it off when we're ready to fly. And that completes the installation. Thank you for taking your time today to watch this video on the proper way to complete an H125 preflight. 
We know that a pre-flight is a critical component to any safe helicopter operation, and we hope that this video will help you enjoy safe flight.